Top Med Talk. Today's Top Med Talk is a two-part piece. This is part two and part one has already been released. Please check out the show notes for more details. I've invited a number of other people to join us. I'm going to quickly introduce them all by name. And then when we first speak to them, I'll get them to introduce themselves a little more. And those who've joined us on the screen now, Damien Bailey, Kim Dora, Chris Garland, Eric Svensson and Andy Shaw. Uh, And we're just going to work our way through a little bit more on the brain and then some of the other organ systems in the body just to see where we are the kind of things we do know about autoregulation in these organs, and perhaps more importantly, the things that we don't know, uh, and then bring that together about its relevance to our patients, particularly those uh, undergoing major surgery. And Dan, if I can interrupt, spent, I, Dan, yeah. if, I, think, I think you didn't mention Mariam because I showed a picture of her earlier, but Mar- I, didn't sorry. I, I didn't name check her. <laughs> I just thought, you know, Mariam, I'd, let, I'd let that so happen I'm now. very sorry. You are definitely there. Uh, Well, we spend a bit of time on the brain, but I just want to go back to it for a moment and introduce uh, Damien Bailey and hear the story perhaps from a real physiologist's perspective and really to ask Damien, are we chasing something that doesn't exist here, looking for a threshold or a magic number? And just get him to firstly introduce himself and and then tell us how it is from the view of a physiologist who's had a great deal of experience in many of the techniques that we've heard Chuck talk about today. Damien. Thanks, Dan, and um, wonderful to contribute to this to this meeting. And, and yes, this is a very real question, Dan, a, a very exciting one. As you mentioned, I, I'm a, a Royal Society research, uh, Wolfson Research Fellow and a Professor of Physiology. So I'm really interested in trying to make the best measurements in order to provide the best mechanistic information, if you like, uh, and then applying that in the clinical setting. Just two points, really, I guess, that's worth mentioning. Um, this is an, inter- you know, an incredibly complex area. There is currently no clear gold standard for assessing cerebral order regulation. I'm going to focus this actually towards the brain, which is my area of interest. But there's no currently accepted gold standard. So much of what we apply in a clinical setting does effectively come down to personal choice, um, what equipment is available. The second point to make really is, you know, it's important that we all accept and understand that cerebral order regulation, it is but one mechanism um, that is involved in the control of cerebral perfusion. For example, there are many other mechanisms that contribute to the control of perfusion, neurovascular coupling. We probably know even less about neurovascular coupling than we know about cerebral order regulation, be it static or dynamic. Carbon dioxide, vasoreactivity, and other mechanisms, for example, the arterial barrier reflex, as an example, heart rate and minute ventilation. So, you know, this is a very real topic. It's a very complex topic. And I think we're making huge strides and trying to encourage the application of really state-of-the-art techniques, as Chuck was alluding to, to try to understand pathophysiology. Thank you, Damien. And do you think we're using the right tools, or, or at least at the beginning of this journey, NIRS? It's a simple tool sometimes in, in the way that we use it clinically, uh, but it can be very advanced in some centres. Do you think that it has value and this is the path that we should go down for now? It's clearly got value. I think it's, you know, we're, we're walking that very fine line of making something practically deliverable in the patient setting and something that will satisfy the physiologists who are really focused on the best measures, for example, using duplex ultrasound, you know, is some of these things are just not practical in the clinical setting. I think we're making huge strides in the application of some of these non-invasive techniques. Other groups, for example, are looking at um, dynamic cerebral autoregulation in, in, for example, hypoxic ischemia brain injury um, using you know, a quadruple lumen bolt and invasive monitoring of ICP, uh, very much state of the art um, and very direct, very invasive. Um, In uh, healthy humans, of course, we've used near infrared spectroscopy, we've used transcranial Doppler ultrasound, we've used duplex. And what I will say is that we're learning so much still in the healthy brain with these techniques, let alone in the injured brain or the disease brain. I mean, as far back as 1895, Bayliss published a paper in the Journal of Physiology highlighting that as brain blood flow increases, or as pressure increases, brain blood flow increases, and as pressure drops, blood flow slackens. It wasn't until probably about 65 years Lassen picked this up 
uh, and reviewed a variety of studies. And we've got that classic auto-regulatory curve where effectively perfusion remains constant between 60 and 150 millimeters of mercury. Now, using a variety of different techniques, we, we can identify that there is clear hysteresis in the brain. So in other words, we've got a more pressure passive circulation. The brain is more adept at buffering increases in pressure towards the hypertensive range than the hypotensive range. So, you know, we're learning a huge amount um, with some of these techniques. Um, a white paper was produced via the International Cerebral Auto Regulation Research Network. This was a paper published in the journal Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism, highlighting some of the nuances, if you like, the idiosyncrasies with a variety, the application of a variety of different techniques. But again, this is very much from a purely physiological, in, in a purely physiological context, uh, and delivering these in the clinical setting. I mean, not all metrics are deliverable in the clinical setting. So uh, yeah, I think NEARS is a role to play. And again, it's about validating some of these measures against some of the more gold standard invasive approaches. I'm going to move on to another organ now. And I want to move on now to what has frequently been described to me as the two most important uh, organs in the body, uh, the kidneys. And I'm going to make up for uh, ignoring Mariam uh, as we introduced ourselves by just asking her, first of all, to to speak about uh, uh, renal physiology and, and then over to, to Andy Shaw uh, to, to sort of um, uh, continue that discussion uh, on, the, on, on renal function and autoregulation. So Mar Mariam and I have known each other for many years, climbed together on Everest, uh, but I'll allow her to introduce herself for you. Hello, Thank you, Mariam. my name is Mariam. Yeah, I am a clinical nephrology intensivist in training. I'm working in London. And I will take the accolade of the most important organs in the body first. And then hopefully with just some revision of very basic physiology, I want to convince you that if they're not the most important organs in the body, they are at least the best auto-regulated organs in the body, the kidneys. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you just a very brief overview of the physiology from a clinician's perspective of why I think that's important. The kidneys have two exquisite mechanisms for regulating blood flow and glomerular filtration rate that are independent of renal perfusion pressure. Those are the myogenic response and the tubular glomerular feedback response via the macula densa. Now, the myogenic response isn't unique to the kidney. It relies on vascular smooth muscle cells to mechanotransduce signals of stretch that then via calcium signaling and activation of myosin-like chain kinase cause those smooth muscle cells to contract. And that's particularly important in the afferent arterial of the glomerulus because of course that's where the business end of the kidney is and that's where all the filtration happens. But the tubular glomerulus <coughs> mechanism is unique to the kidney and it's fascinating because it is it allows us to regulate the blood flow to the kidney based on the metabolic activity of the kidney so just a very brief walk through the nephron at the glomerulus will just take sodium chloride is filtered into the bovum's capsule and sodium chloride is then reabsorbed by co-transporters and transporters at the proximal tubule. Now, the sodium chloride that makes it through the loop of Henle up the ascending limb will meet at the distal end of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, the macula densa cells. And there it transduces, again, sodium signaling that via ATP and adenosine and then calcium signaling, again, has a effect on the afferent arterial via vascular smooth muscle cells. Now, those are just the intrinsic pathways by which the kidney regulates itself. But I have not even mentioned the extrinsic sympathetic uh, renin and gesensinatal steering system that the kidney is to help auto-regulate other organs in the body. Does the kidney win? <laughs> Thank you. I think it was alluded to when, um, when we were talking to Chuck ab about the fact that we're all very concerned about the brain and we think very hard about its auto-regulation. And do you think that simply focusing on the brain and making sure that the brain is okay is by surrogate going to make going to allow the kidneys to function normally or or do we need to be looking at them separately i guess that's where the kidneys involvement in regulating systemic blood pressure control is really important but it's important also to 
remember that the kidneys are a bit more protected than that because the renal blood flow is not primarily dependent on metabolic demand or the demand of other organs. It has normally an excess of blood flow. That's how we maintain our very high glomerular filtration rates. So what can be susceptible to uh, oxygen so changes in oxygen delivery is the medulla of the kidney where oxygen demand can be compromised first. But mm. as far as the cortex of the kidney is concerned and the function of the kidney is concerned, there are a lot of buffering mechanisms, including sort of local vasodilator effects with things such as prostaglandins to counteract the effects of systemic vasoconstriction, which, you know, in a sense, protect it and leave it in a bit of a protected milieu that perhaps mean that we can prioritize something like the brain, which, you know, I, I completely accept Dr. Hogue's point that, that there's there's not much going back once you've caused damage there. No, no, absolutely. And we also talked a little about biomarkers. And do you think that biomarkers will play a useful role in autoregulation of the kidney? Or, or really, is the horse already bolted then? And when you see a biomarker, the damage is done and, and you failed in your role to protect that organ. Where do you see the role of biomarkers for this? Yeah, the problem with all these monitoring mechanisms is that actually, much like the brain, I would love to have a constant dynamic reflection of what the kidney is doing that is independent of sex, independent of age, independent of ethnicity. I'd like it to be independent of the things that we do to the patient. And that would be my ideal biomarker. That would be my ideal means of monitoring the patient. I would love to have an ICP monitor that I could stick into the kidney because it is a capsulated organ and it is susceptible to fluid overload, for example. I would love to have near infrared, infrared um, nears for the kidney because I think I would mm. place an electrode on my patient, put them on the operating table, and perhaps if we could try to discern whether the renal blood flow is altered intraoperatively in a way that impacts outcome, we would find ways of, of measuring other biomarkers that, that can help us determine care. But uh, there are plenty of early biomarkers that do reflect kidney cell stress and not kidney cell death. It just remains for any to be really validated and available in a sort of point of care uh, scenarios that, that makes them applicable to our clinical scenario. That's fantastic, thank you. I'd like to bring Andy into the discussion now. Um, and uh, you, you published a number of papers and have been involved in, in studies with uh, related to renal function over the years. So uh, I wonder what your view on this is and where the holes in our evidence base are and where research may go in the future with regards to autoregulation, specifically for the kidneys. And, and perhaps you can just introduce yourself for, for everyone for us, that would be lovely, thank you. Yeah, of course. Good morning, uh, everybody from Western Canada. I would agree with my colleague that the soul resides within the kidneys. Um, although in uh, in Edmonton this week, it's all about the liver. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware what I'm referring to, just Google uh, the, this, this week's uh, Nobel Prize for Medicine announcement. Um, I do think, I do think autoregulation is a big deal in the kidney. I think one of the things that we've focus traditionally on is the importance of the input pressure, the MAP. But if you look at the vascular waterfall diagram, you'll see that it's probably the delta between the mean systemic filling pressure and the CVP, where the real opportunity to modify it is. And, and I want to highlight Mariam's point that the kidney is encapsulated. And the Monroe Kelly doctrine applies to the kidney just like it applies to the brain. And we've not really paid a lot of attention to that. Historically, people have said, oh, the CVP doesn't matter. It probably does, but for a different reason. And I think that area is worthy of, of, of more investigation. There are techniques in development for measuring um, very small changes in renal blood flow using ultrasound, the renal resistive index, for example. There are also real-time measures of GFR based on optical dilution techniques, which are almost here. So I do think there will be a lot of change in this space from the perspective of how can we understand what determines renal blood flow, both nutritive and non-nutritive renal blood flow in the next um, you know, three years or so. In terms of blood pressure specifically, 
I have a slightly different view than Chuck's that the importance of population-based data is that it raises a flag, it raises alarm. And there are plenty of examples where large observational data sets have subsequently been confirmed by the prospective trial. So I do think it's important to, to weigh that um, against the need for individualized intervention data. If the effect size, for example, is so small, in other words, one to 2% absolute change in outcome, then you can't detect that in your own practice. So you need studies of hundreds of thousands of patients to raise the alarm and then drill in with the sort of technology that Chuck uses to start to measure whether or not interventions can actually make a difference. And we have to assume that they can because we almost the, the entirety of the rest of our practice in the intensive care unit room is maintenance of a hemodynamic milieu which we believe is the right one for that patient. So I think in, in sum, the way that organs determine who gets how much blood flow really does matter. I think we've been barking up the wrong tree a bit with, with the input systemic pressure because we can measure it. We need to be more sophisticated than that and start to look at those very small but, but important changes between mean systemic filling pressure and CVP. I think there's a fantastic point, Sandy. Thank you. And it, and it, and it really is important to focus on are we measuring the right thing, as you say, the systolic blood pressure, the mean blood pressure and, and other derivatives of that. Uh, and I think, I think that's something we need to think about a lot further as we move forward with this project. Um, in, in the interest of time, I'm just going to move to my co-chair for a moment. Um, uh, when I, I think pretty much the first time I met Monty uh, in around 2003, it was to ask if we could borrow this box off his uh, desk in the intensive care unit at the Middlesex Hospital, something I'd never come across before, called gastric tonometer. Um, which a small group of us then trundled up a mountain to insert into one another to look at our gastric perfusion. And this was really my, uh, my, my first sort of exposure to, to, to gastric research, to altitude research. And I learned a lot from that. And I just asked Monty, because you've used this technique a lot over the years uh, in the research that you've done, and some more research recently looking at the microcirculation in the physiology lab, just a, about the gut, and um, have we just completely forgotten about the gut altogether and we don't care about it, or should we begin to refocus on it and find new ways uh, of looking at gut perfusion, Monty? Short answer is yes, we should be worrying about gut perfusion. Mm -hmm. But from the point of view of this round table and auto-regulation of gut blood flow per se, I think the reason that there's relatively little known or written about it is because the idea that there's a lower limit of water regulation of the GI tract that is clinically relevant is un unlikely. It doesn't make sense teleologically, and it's not a major way of perturbing gut blood flow. Uh, gut blood flow, if we're talking about the stomach and the small bowel, which is where I've done most of my research, distinct from the liver, which is a different discussion, and distinct from whether vessels have atherosclerosis or abnormal anatomy, which is yet another discussion, it is the fact that uh, it, is, it appears to be, and is highly likely, that the lower limit of autoregulation, if it exists for the GI tract, is well below that of the brain or the kidney. Now, where autoregulation comes into play for the gut is its blood supply is very subservient to the whim of the kidney, particularly from the renin angiotensin perspective. So it's ultra-sensitive to changes in volume and flow that result in redistribution of blood volume and flow, and it pays a heavy price for that. If you're getting the distribution of total blood flow around the body, the gut will suffer and suffer early while you're making other organs, including the kidney, and you know, top of the hierarchy, the brain look good, you might be hurting the gut. So I think there's a lot to revisit there. And when gastric tonometry was clinically available, we could measure it in real time, and it had some flaws, but it was robust and it worked and it taught us a lot. Thanks, Monty. And do you think from what you've seen looking at the microcirculation in, in the laboratory, do you think this may be a, a reasonable surrogate for looking at gut blood flow in terms of autoregulation? I do from the point of view of experimentation. I don't think it's clinically viable in its current form. You know, there are and have been for quite a long time, there are alternative ways by introducing tubes into the lumen of the GI tract that you can make surrogate measures of gut flow and oxygenation. I think what you can say from the controlled laboratory environments, observing the classical idea of autoregulation is that 
flow does seem to be maintained in a steady state over a broad range of pressures. However, as you'll see, if you watch our virtual physiology lab or some of the data presented later in this meeting, a small amount of hypovolemia results in severe compromise of gut mucosal blood flow in particular. But, but I don't think, strictly speaking, that's autoregulation of the blood supply to the GI tract. It is the fact that the kidney is detecting things and, and producing a predominantly humoral response that results in a loss of gut microcirculatory perfusion. And, and if that persists, it, it can have uh, dire consequences. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to move on to the heart and the lungs now. Eric seems to have vanished momentarily, so uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask uh, Chris and Kim to, to introduce themselves. I'm really, um, I was going to leave the heart till, till last, prim primarily because it, it's the generator of all this blood pressure and flow that we've been talking about here. And just to really tell us what, what it is we do know and don't know currently about the cardiovascular system and how uh, it auto-regulates itself from a, from a physiological perspective. So over, over to you, um, Kim and Chris, thank you. Um, hi, yeah, so I'm Chris Carlin. So I'm a professor in the pharmacology department, actually, in uh, Oxford University. And... and I'm Kim, I'm in the lab next door, also a professor, and we both teach the undergraduate medical students here in Oxford. So we're not clinicians ourselves, but we do do some clinically relevant research. I take, we both study the microcirculation from the brain, from the heart, and most recently in the heart, we've been collecting samples from patients undergoing surgery, heart surgery. So I've been looking at the microcirculation there. So we study the blood vessels in isolation and we can study their um, changes in tension or diameter. And do, Chris does electrophysiology, I do calcium imaging. But overall, I think we can talk between what we teach the medical students and what we know ourselves from the lab and perhaps help with the discussion. So yeah, so, I mean, the interesting thing, you, you've come to the heart last, but of course, none of the others would be, none of the other organ systems would be working without autoregulation in, in the heart. Um, in, in terms of trying to work out a hierarchy, this is quite an interesting one. And one way you can, you can, try and get a bit of a handle on that is to look at the effects of exercise, I think. Because what happens there, of course, is that the blood flow is stolen by the skeletal muscle, which represents a huge muscle, a, a huge sort of thing, uh, if you like, of, of, of blood once it, once it vasodilates. Uh, and both the heart, the brain, and the skeletal muscle and the kidneys, of course, all depend on uh, the myogenic tone that Marion very, very uh, nicely described. But on top of that, the, the isolated vessel studies tell us that the myogenic response is quite slow, so working over sort of seconds. Whereas those with skeletal muscle tell us that the, the blood vessels can start changing diameter within uh, uh, um, far less than a second as soon as the muscle fiber starts contracting. And this is active hyperemia, the release of local factors which are then modulating that myogenic tone. So perhaps what we should be looking at is, is how in each organ system those, those local factors are working. And I think when you take a measurement of cerebral blood flow and by non-invasive means, of course what you're looking at is, is a whole overall picture. You're trying to work at a sort of threshold for the, the myogenic um, or auto-regulatory auto response, you're really looking at big vessels and small vessels. Uh, and the small vessels are, are, are very reactive. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a bit more about that. Yeah, so if we compare the different vascular beds, so we've talked how the brain has a nice sort of regulation and basically low pressure and high pressure, it's relatively stable. We know that in the if you take out one of those blood vessels in the microcirculation and change the pressure artificially, you can cannulate both ends of the blood vessel and introduce luminal pressure into the artery, then there are lots of mechanisms with intrinsic to the smooth muscle that when pressure elevates, it tries to stop that blood vessel from expanding. So in other words, the myogenic tone is maintained, but then the smooth muscle itself will try to maintain that that level of contraction through that range of pressures. 
there, no one yet knows how much the endothelium that lines the lumen of those blood vessels contributes. But we do know that if you take the same size blood vessel from skeletal muscle and again give it the luminal pressure, it again has that beautiful myogenic response, so that same pressure range, but the endothelium in that situation doesn't feed back and the smooth muscle doesn't feed back, so the contraction is more robust than in the brain. So that means that the brain in some ways is more, more able to account for changes in blood pressure and maintain the perfusion into it. Whereas in the muscle where you don't want much blood flow at rest, the blood vessels remain closed. So that leaves that opportunity for them to open. And I think in the kidney, the myogenic response is also important in the efferent arterioles. So we've got to have, for that filtration rate and everything else, we've got to have that flow going from the afferent to the efferent. So if the, the pressure releases on the on the afferent side, then it's also got to release on the efferent side to get that flow going, doesn't it? I think we've got to think about, when we're thinking about surgery, and this is not something that we know anything much about, so I'm just thinking of, of it off, off the cuff, really. But if blood pressure is in the lower range, we're relying, as, as Andy was saying, that we need the heart to pump that blood to get that pressure into, to get the flow into the, into the brain. And same for the other organs. Whereas when the pressure is too high, you're relying on the intrinsic mechanisms within that tissue to try and allow the blood not, not to damage the microcirculation effectively is how, is how we look at it. Well, I just made one comment to sort of finish up, I guess, and that is, and this goes back to, to Monty mentioning the microcirculation. Of course, people look at the, the large blood vessels because they can. It's more difficult to look at the microcirculation. But it's interesting that uh, from a clinical standpoint, it does seem there is increasing evidence that dysfunction within the microcirculation occurs really early on in the disease process and seems to precede any sort of obvious structural changes in, in larger blood vessels. So looking forward, I guess the, the way we should be going is, is somehow having some measure of microcirculatory function. Yeah, and on top of that, I think in terms of anaesthesia, and you guys obviously know a million times more than we do about this and the mechanisms of why the blood pressure reduces. But as I understand it, part of the reason is a drop in the sympathetic nervous system operating. So in other words, the levels of noradrenaline would be lower on the blood vessel. So from what we understand in, in the brain, there isn't much effect of the, the catecholamine to cause constriction. In the heart, obviously, the catecholamines are vasodilators normally, whereas in the muscle and the gut, especially the gut has a huge sympathetic network on it. Noradrenaline is a vasoconstrictor. So in terms of rescuing your body in, in a situation of low blood pressure, when normally the, the sympathetic system should be hugely activated, it's, it's at, the, at, the, at the extent of the gut and the skeletal muscle, but trying to maintain the flow in the heart and the, and the brain. And, and in the kidney, uh, I think noradrenaline is still a very potent vasoconstrictor, constrictor, isn't it? So I guess maybe the kidney isn't the, uh, doesn't win all the time. And, and Chuck, thank you very much indeed. And, 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 and Chuck kind of touched upon um, looking at the upper end of the curve as well, which is not something we usually are uh, so, so worried about uh, um, in, in anaesthesia. It's mainly maintaining a minimum map. But what, what do you think the damaging properties when we go over and above the, the autoregulatory threshold? Um, Chuck mentioned a sort of hyperemia. Uh, and do you think this causes damage to the, to the microcirculation as well? One, one thing about going up to high blood pressure, of course, is that really one of, one of the, the, the effects of the myogenic response in blood vessels is to protect the capillaries downstream by you know, stabilizing the blood pressure. If you start forcing the blood pressure up to very high levels, that starts to, to break down and, 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 and produce problems and produce capillary damage and, and obviously fluid movement. There's obviously elastin in the wall of the blood vessels and, and collagen around and it, trying to keep that resistance so that it's not just only the blood vessel that's helping that resistance. But when you get the pressure too high, it's obviously going to get to the point where it's not compliant anymore and the pressure's just going to start ripping things to bits. I just want to introduce our, uh, our last speaker now, Eric Svensson, and, and Eric's going to bring the discussion over to the lungs, his real area of expertise. Um, 
So, so perhaps you could just introduce yourself, uh, Eric, uh, and, and tell us your thoughts uh, on, on pulmonary physiology and how it fits in to this whole story. We don't normally think about the lungs as being an organ we have to worry about with, with autoregulation uh, during an anaesthetic, but may maybe you can convince us otherwise and, and tell us what we, we should know uh, about pulmonary physiology. Thanks, Eric. With pleasure, Dan, and uh, thank you for the invitation to join you all. Uh, I'm a uh, professor of medicine and critical care medicine at the University of Washington and do pulmonology. Uh, and we've been hearing about the regulation in all the systemic organs and some overriding common principles, uh, most of which don't apply to the lung at all. And that's uh, a unique, the lung's a unique organ, and I'm not saying that simply because I am a pulmonologist. It sits uniquely in this population such that what we have is no evidence whatsoever of autoregulation in the sense of serving the lung tissue itself. Now, there is regulation, which I'll get into, not to preserve tissue integrity. It's rather to maintain gas exchange. And the reason why the lung simply doesn't have any real reason to autoregulate is, first of all, it's a very metabolically inactive organ. It's simply just a, a large, thin sheet of cells across which gas exchange occurs. And it takes the entire cardiac output. Even though the kidney is considered to be richly perfused and important, I want to just mention a very famous quip by Homer Smith, one of the most eminent renal physiologists ever, who said the purpose of the heart is to pump blood to the kidney. So I think one of our panelists might enjoy that quite a bit. But the lung gets the entire cardiac output and through the pulmonary circulation, but also another 1% of cardiac output is through the bronchial circulation so that you can see that uh, that combination means that the lung simply doesn't have to worry much at all. And it gets its oxygen both by the bronchial blood supply, the pulmonary arterial supply, and then also by ventilation. So in a way, it sits pretty in terms of not being at any real risk for some of the perturbations that we've been talking about. Having said that, of course, there is autoregulation of the lung. It's just the opposite of what we see in the systemic tissues. So we know that in the systemic tissues, there's hypoxic dilation and hypercapnic dilation. But in the lung, we know that hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and hypercapnic pulmonary vasoconstriction occur. And these are autoregulatory mechanisms in the sense of maintaining optimum gas exchange, matching ventilation and perfusion most efficiently. So those um, are really the fundamental features of the pulmonary circulation and aspects of autoregulation. And these responses like hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and hypercarbonic pulmonary vasoconstriction are quite rapid and do quite a good job under most circumstances in maintaining uh, better gas exchange under threats of either low blood flow, uh, infection, all the stresses that the lung is subjected to. But at some point, there may be a decline in tissue oxygenation such that these autoregulatory mechanisms fail, and perhaps even we might see the genesis of something that looks more like a systemic response. So as the lung tissue becomes very, very hypoxic, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction fails. Uh, this might be just energetic failure, but it also may be some mechanism of the lung parenchyma saying, I have to protect myself as well, forget the rest of the body. So I think those are the points I wanted to make and could leave it open for any questions from you, Dan, or others. Thank you, Eric. That's fantastic. What sort of effect do you think that mechanical ventilation has on this process? Because you know, many of our patients are mechanically ventilated when, when under anesthesia. And, and do, you, do you think we are making matters worse for the lungs by doing this with this artificial positive pressure that we're providing? Well, I think in the broad um, cases of surgery that um, don't involve maintaining someone with uh, 
abnormal lungs, probably mechanical ventilation really has nothing important. But as we're dealing with patients either in the ITU or uh, on this operating table with bad lung function, of course, some of what we have to do to maintain tissue oxygenation and preserve arterial oxygenation may involve high levels of PEEP, and those can interfere with some of these mechanisms. So um, we're always sort of searching for that sweet spot between how do we maintain best gas exchange, but not limit hemodynamics or uh, oxygen delivery elsewhere. Thank you, Eric. And do we, we, what about the role of carbon dioxide as well? I mean, uh, certainly in, perhaps in intensive care, we're a little bit more focused at just titrating things up and down very carefully all the time because we, we have the ability to do that uh, and, and perhaps the time. Um, sometimes during an anesthetic, we, we may be sort of looking at many other things at once and carbon dioxide may be not one of the things that we're focusing on. And do you think that we should be focusing in a little more on the control of carbon dioxide in patients undergoing surgery in order to preserve some of these autoregulatory functions that, that, that the lungs have? Well, um, I think that uh, the issue of, of carbon dioxide is very, very interesting. And perhaps what we uh, sometimes are too aggressive about is trying to maintain normal capnia or even, even hypocapnia with the idea that um, the body doesn't uh, respond well to carbon dioxide. So it's a, it's a broad, broad uh, issue in terms of both what's happening at the systemic level as opposed to the uh, level of the lungs in terms of, of CO2. But I, but I think that uh, we, we are shifting more toward a general permissive hypercapnia if that condition allows for a gentler treatment of the lungs and I don't think the tissues are badly served at all by a slight degree of hypercapnia. Uh, in fact, it may stimulate the sympathetic nervous system a bit to uh, enhance cardiac uh, output. But again, we always uh, run a, a thin line here as to what's, what's right. Thank you very much, Eric. We've, we've about 10 minutes to go and we've, we've worked our way through the organs now. Um, so, so I'd just like to ask Monty and then, and then Sol after that, um, what they think of all this. What, what, what themes do you think are coming out of this uh, and, and any comments at all about any of the organ systems that we, we have covered here uh, in, in different ways and where we should perhaps go next uh, with our discussions um, of the organs individually and then together in, in, in a whole human. Monty, thanks. So, so I, I think the first thing for us to do is re reflect on these discussions which I found very, very stimulating, um, it, it prompting me to go back and reread some of the basic physiology that has been written in the past. Now, I'm guessing that when I do that, what I'll identify from the point of view of if I'm going to be part of the team representing the splanchnic organs and or just the GI tract, we'll find quite a long list of known unknowns uh, from the point of view of bringing that into the clinical setting. So I'm looking forward to continuing down this path and then bringing that organ specific learning together with the broader group to see if we can piece it together and make some sense that we can bring to the bedside and then test clinically. The, the human body is incredibly complex and we're at risk uh, as we enter this sort of stage of having things like a simplistic mean arterial pressure target of, of taking a, uh, a blunt tool to a very complex problem. So I think this is a, a, a great starting place to generate a long list of questions. I'm not sure how many answers we'll have at the end of it, but we'll have a long list of questions. No. Thanks, Monty. And do you think we, we need to also um, return to the laboratory, like the, the facility you've been working in, to, to test out some of these uh, known unknowns, if you like, to, to sort of uh, bring us up to physiology 2020? You know? Yeah, I think at risk of having gone a, a little bit, if not far too pragmatic. I um, mean, I think there's been a lot that we've learned during COVID-19, for example, where we've had a single disease process, but in a very complex environment, where a lot of first principles had played out. And I think to a certain extent, uh, as we've gone into large pragmatic clinical trials, we've lost sight of what we can learn from basic science and first principles and, and human physiology in particular. So I think that going back to the laboratory, going back to the bench, and then doing that classical bridging into earlier 
much more detailed trials and then take that through to the much more pragmatic clinical approach uh, is, is a worthy endeavor. Thanks, Marty. And Sol, you've been, you've been very involved in this from, the, from its genesis and, and, and you've been able to listen to what we've discussed today. What, what, what comments and thoughts do you have uh, about this now? I just want to thank everybody for their thoughts and insights on, on this subject. It's, it's always been a passion. I, I would I, I, I add that back in my youth when I was at the University of Chicago, it, it takens me back at Harkins to the days when I was using contrast ultrasound, um, injecting non-diffusible intravascular tracers of essentially perlofluorocarbon filled albumin spheres uh, to look at blood flow in, in the heart and the kidney in real time. And what we sort of gathered in those days is that um, it's not just the myogenic autoregulatory responses so nicely uh, stated, but there's also other elements of the, the regional milieu, albeit ischemia or metabolic, that are also kind of impacting this, this sort of what we used to call the winking and blinking phenomena of the capillaries themselves being recruited within the regional blood flow of whatever organ. That at any given time, there's a constant dynamic of gates opening and gates shutting to allow blood flow that is interestingly changed whether you're talking about a pressure myogenic, if you will, stimulus versus an ischemic one. The, the vasoconstriction, vasodilation phenomena is one of pressure related Whereas in ischemia, all gates are open maximally and, and it's limited by the um, macro, as much as micro vasculature to determine blood flow um, conditions. I, I, it, it really does force us to appreciate that our ability to apply clinical tools like blood pressure and those crude, if you will, um, devices that we use to try to insinuate what's going on at the regional blood flow level is, is a far cry from where we're at. Um, and so I, I just, again, would, would say in closing, this is a wonderfully stimulating discussion to bring us back to um, uh, recognizing and respecting the, the gaps that still exist between the laboratory and our um, experimental appreciation of regional uh, blood flow, albeit in the kidney or the heart or the, or the brain. And, and, and our abilities to, to infer what's going on with our clinical tools today. Thanks very much, Sol. And I, I wondered if I could just work my way around the screen, and we, we've really only a couple of minutes left now, just, just to get a, a last word from, from, from each of you, uh, uh, just, to, just to, to sum up uh, your, your thoughts on this. So I'll just start with Andy at, at the top of my screen, uh, if I could. Yeah, it's been a fabulous uh, hour and a half. Thank you very much for the opportunity to take part. What I've taken away from this is the need to translate. We've got people working in different spheres and it's time that we all came together. And I think those of us in that space have a responsibility to, to reread the old physiology, which of course is only old because we think it is. It's the physiology, we need to understand that. And then apply the last 25 years worth of technological development uh, in a setting whereby patients who are why we're all here ultimately can benefit and, and that space has changed a little bit too so thank you for the opportunity I think it's been a wonderful hour and a half but I still think the kidneys are the most important <laughs> thank you very much Mariam <laughs> Um, I think that was, that was put beautifully, actually. I would, I would echo that. I think the expertise on this panel just has gone to show that there are many commonalities. Uh, what we are all, I think, uh, striving for and shouting out for is ways in which we can translate that into, into clinical investigation and bring the basic science towards the clinical need to match things up for the better study. Thank you very much. Eric? Uh, it was a pleasure to join you all and relearn and learn new things here. My parting thoughts would be that as each of us sometimes focus on our own organ and trying to optimize its survival and function, we have to be very careful by what means we're doing that because in some cases it could be beneficial to other organs, but at the same time as we've alluded to, sometimes what we do for one organ may come at the price of everything else. And of course the brain sits atop literally everything and figuratively. 
but we have to be very careful in preserving brain blood flow with some of the things that we do commonly uh, that we're not harming anything else. And so just keeping this broad overview of the complexity and keeping in mind how other organs might fare uh, is, is paramount. Thank you, Eric. Chris? Well, yeah, again, thank you for, for inviting us. I, you know, it's been really interesting hearing completely different perspectives uh, on, on things that we're sort of familiar with from a different slant. And I, I think I'd actually one thing, obviously, we're limited on, we've been limited in time and what we can discuss. But one thing that didn't come up, we talked about carbon dioxide, and I just leave, leave you with this as an anesthetist, and that is that, you know, uh, as the blood, as the red blood cells offload oxygen, and they start spewing out adenosine triphosphate, which has a vasodilator role and, and contributes into, in, in autoregulation. And also, if you, if you believe some people, also releasing nitric oxide, which is a powerful vasodilator. So these, this is an area perhaps for future discussion, but I'd leave you with that, I guess. Thank you very much. Kim? <laughs> Oh, yes, I echo Chris's comments, but I think the other big thing that the world has to think about is how we measure not only blood flow with going to an organ, but also within an organ. And I don't think the technology allows us to do that yet. But for example, in the heart, when we have low blood pressure, the flow preferentially goes to the epicardial surface, and that can be measured by measuring those myogenic response curves in blood vessels dissected out from the epicardium or the endocardium, and the curves different intrinsic to those blood vessels. So there's a lot to do that we can link our basic science to what you guys are measuring clinically, and it's I think there's a huge area there for, for translation. I think it's exciting. Thank you very much. And, and finally, Damien. Yeah, no, thanks again for the invitation. Fascinating. I, I can sense a degree of competition, uh, certainly in terms of the most important. And, uh, you know, again, very much as a team player, we need to integrate and translate here. They're all equally important. Just one final word, really, is that molecules are having increasingly more meaning. And the molecular transduction of some of these hemodynamic signals, I think, in terms of the biomarker field, the brain is a great example. You know, there's huge strides being made uh, in laboratory-based experiments looking at the neurovascular units. So looking at the consequences of imperfect autoregulation, I think we can learn a lot again from, you know, perhaps inviting molecular biochemists to the field because I think they've got a lot to uh, contribute as well. I agree. And we thank you very much, Damien. Uh, and thank you very much to all of you. It's been a, a truly fascinating discussion. We have run out of time. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, for your contributions and I'm, I'm going to hand back to uh, Monty in the studio now. So thank you all. Thank you, Dan, and thank you again to absolutely uh, everyone concerned. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioptive medicine we'd love you to find out more about that if you check out ebpom.org you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home check out ebpom.org now <laughs>